I want to talk about Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, the uh, master-slave discourse. And uh, this is quite a complex work. I mean, I don't know that I <clears throat> really understand uh, this book, but um, I have tried. Um, you know, I've read it several times. Um, but uh, I'm going to give you my interpretation of it. And, um, and I think, you know, at a bare minimum, I can, I can uh, say that Hegel would agree with what I'm saying in relationship to Cartesian mind-body dualism. Okay, so um, now one thing that's often overlooked, uh, I'm not quite sure how, but it is uh, sometimes, especially when we're doing like introductory sort of treatments of Hegel, that uh, sometimes the master-slave discourse is, is, is taught as if it weren't about self-consciousness, but it's within the section of the book that's on self-consciousness. Um, so the master-slave discourse is not about slavery or oppression or tyranny in any ordinary sort of way uh, of discussing the matter. It is about self-consciousness. And my simplified way of, of treating it is to think in terms of uh, Cartesian mind-body dualism. And what uh, Descartes implies, and I, I think what he, he intends is that the mind rules the body, that the mind is the master and the body is the slave. That at least is the impression that most people get. And, um, and that is what most people who believe in some way in mind-body dualism, that's sort of their first inclination or the predominant inclination amongst people is to think that really the mind is in control of the body. And you might ask yourself, uh, do you believe that your, mi your mind controls your body or does your body control your mind? And I think I've asked you that question before. So ha hopefully you've thought about that. Um, and so, uh, let's, let me, you know, again, give a simplified version of the master-slave discourse uh, from that perspective. Hegel, um, Hegel would say that, uh, well, what Hegel starts out in the master-slave discourse from the perspective of the master. And so if we think of taking the perspective of the ego, of the Cartesian ego that looks out into the world from the pineal gland, right? But there's no pineal gland. It's like Leibniz with the pods in, in the matrix. You know, the, the, pine, the pineal gland disappears and, and the mind is, is not in space and uh, not in time. Uh, either, and I think I should have emphasized that earlier with Leibniz, uh, when, when, we, when I did the matrix analogy and then I said, but the, but the pods disappear, they disappear from space, they also disappear from time. And time and space is just a construct of the matrix in this Leibnizian view. And, and Hegel is in that tradition, that Leibnizian tradition. And so, if we're thinking in terms of Cartesian mind-body dual, mind dualism with Hegel, the mind is not in space or time. Uh, in essence, at least, you know, at the beginning of his master-slave discourse, the mind is not in space or time. 
the body is in space and time. And the, the mind is perfectly at rest and, um, and dominates the body in that Leibnizian way. Uh, and so the mind is the master and the body is the slave. And what now happens is as the mind begins to self-reflect in the way that Aristotle's God self-reflects and then unfolds the universe out of itself, the, each individual mind does, each individual person does the same thing. And so as you self-reflect on your own being, you unfold out of yourself um, primarily your body uh, and its activity in space and time. Um, and so in this Leibnizian way, the mind is the master and the body is the slave, but as the mind begins to self-reflect, it begins to see the body as itself. This is self-consciousness. And, and so as you see your body, for example, out in front of my face here is my hand, I see my body and I can abstract myself from the body and say, well, I am the mind distinct from my body. But at some point, uh, as I self-reflect, I begin to realize that my body is myself. And then the question arises quite, quite seriously for the mind. Does the mind rule the body or does the body rule the mind? And then this instigates what Hegel calls a life and death struggle. That the body and the mind can't coexist. One has to kill the other. And this is on the view of taking empiricism seriously, taking this mechan mechanistic view of humanity, like developed by John Locke and then elaborated like Marquis de Sade and even showing up in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. If the body is a machine and it is not me, then why can't the machine take over? And so here we see Hegel taking empiricism very seriously. And he is living now in a fully, you know, a much more developed scientific world than Leibniz was in, for example. And so you have to take the mechanical sciences and all the technological advances that are taking place, you have to take that seriously. And is it possible that the body is an artificial intelligence and that there is no need for the mind? And this is the life and death struggle. Um, and what then Hegel does is through an elaborate thought experiment uh, with his own unique terminology. And, you know, so it's really dense and hard to get inside of. But when you reread it several times, you start to, you start to at least get the feel for it um, and things start to fall into place. And it is a kind of Cartesian meditation, but but not the kind of meditation like you read it once and then you think about it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you kind of come to your own conclusion. It's like a kind of meditation that you have to read, you know, 20, 30, 50 times, something like that, um, before 
you really start to get a handle, but, but each time you see a little bit more of what Hegel is getting at. And, he's, and, and you know, he says very clearly that he's not doing a, any sort of standard uh, logical deduction. Uh, he's doing a philosophical uh, deduction. So he wants to distinguish between like doing math and proving a theorem versus doing philosophy, that philosophy is a very different thing. And he believes that he's refounding philosophy on an entirely new ground in the same way that Descartes claimed to be refounding philosophy on, a, on an entirely different grounding. And Kant claimed to be refounding philosophy on an entirely different ground. So, you know, he's um, one in a string of these fellows, uh, especially rationalists who are trying to redefine philosophy. And he wants to redefine philosophy as this, um, as this philosophical meditation and it's a philosophical meditation on self-consciousness. Okay, so I think, I don't think that Hegel would disagree with what I've said about mind-body dualism and that the, that the body and the mind cannot coexist as conceived by Descartes and most philosophers, including Kant, up until Hegel's day. Because Kant still is holding on to these noumena and he believes that he's found the back door to the noumena through the, the critique of practical reason. And so he's holding on to that idea of the mind that is separate from the body. And uh, that is very clearly in Kant's construction, the legislator of the body in time and space. Uh, it's the executive. The soul mind is the executive of the body and dominates the body as executive, as master. Uh, and that's what Kant conceives of as moral duty and a clear understanding of moral duty. But Hegel takes seriously that maybe the body can do without the mind. And if so, then the mind is going to die in this confrontation. But through his meditation, what he, what he resolves is that the body and the mind are one. And so the real substance in an Aristotelian uh, way of talking, the real substance has two aspects. It has the the uh, formal aspect, which would be the mind, and, and the material aspect, which is the body. Um, but these are really one thing. So that's why I went into a lot of detail about uh, Aristotle's metaphysics, um, because that is an interpretation you can give. And then Hegel is, again, just like Leibniz and just like Descartes, maybe, defending Aristotelianism against uh, a scientism uh, that you know, becomes empiricism in, the, in, in Lockean terms. And, and, and as I've also tried to demonstrate, you know, the Lockean metaphysics isn't, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty clunky. It's not very sophisticated, although that's largely what people believe like in the United States especially in the mid 20th century, um, uh, it's, it's a clunky metaphysics. And so, um, so Hegel is, you know, like Hume, like Kant, trying to take both empiricism and traditional metaphysics seriously, but Kant and Hegel fall much more on the side of traditional metaphysics, but Hegel here shows in terms of traditional German ideology that the mind and the body are one thing, that as they confront one another, and he has this kind of imagery of them coming at each other in this fight of life or death. 
and sort of being like like poles of a magnet. So if you've ever taken a magnet and you try to put the same in poles together, they they always like kind of veer off from one another. It's like they don't they can't easily they 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 kind of go past one another naturally, but in the fight or life or death, they force themselves to come to that very moment where they 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 use all their force and it's for every you know uh action there's an equal and opposite reaction and they're really working to hit each other and in that moment where they kiss and they actually confront one another there's a sublimation to a different state so just like the way um, if you remember from high school physics or chemistry, um, material can be in several different states. You can have uh, a solid state, a liquid state, and uh, a vaporous state. So for example, like a piece of ice is solid. If you melt it, it becomes liquid, it becomes water. And if you continue to heat it, it goes to another state of vapor. Um, and there are substances that once they reach uh, a certain temperature or when they're when they're met with another uh, chemical substance, they go, it's not a continuous process, they just jump. And it's called sublation. And it's just a quantum leap to another level of another state of material existence. Um, that's what Hegel wants to say is these two, uh, the mind and the body confront one another in a life or death struggle. They, they tend to not be able to, to hit each other, but as they work at it and come back around and come back around, Finally, they do overcome that force and touch. And once they touch, it's a quantum leap. And, and, and a quantum leap to what Hegel conceives as a higher state of being. And so, um, so this, uh, this vanishing point where they meet you know, just the instantaneous uh, uh, point, uh, the mathematically infinitesimal in, in Leibniz's language and in the, in the terminology of, of calculus, an infinitely precise point of, of union. Uh, they do that sublation to a, in a quantum leap to a higher level of being and in this higher level of being, the body and the mind are one. And now the mind, uh, the self-consciousness, let's say, no longer the Cartesian mind, but uh, Geist, you know, uh, Hegel has now recourse to German lingo. And so he uses German in, in ways uh, that distinguish it from Aristotelian philosophy and from Cartesian philosophy and even from Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz wrote in French. Um, and, and so this, this Geist, this spirit, now is a self-conscious spirit, genuinely self-conscious and conceives of the body and the mind of these older ways of thinking as one thing, as all part of, of its being. Um, and, and what has occurred through this sublimation process, through this struggle of this life and death struggle, and then the, the point of sublim sublimation is the overcoming of alienation. 
that the mind is sort of in a sorry state when it is alienated uh, from his, from its body and 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 sorry state uh, is uh, I can't remember the phrasing in the phenomenology, but uh, it's it's very similar to that uh, the um, the sorrow of the soul, but it, it's it's a sorry state, and he compares it to um, going through different philosophical schools, um, and uh, compares it to Stoicism. Stoics, you know, so the Cartesian mind dualism goes back to the Stoics of the time uh, of Aristotle. And then all the way, uh, Stoicism became very popular around the time of Jesus uh, in Roman society. And people began to think of the, their, their soul as separate from their body. And so Stoicism has a lot to say about this and, and, and struggles with the, the mind-body dualism issue. And at times tends to overcome the dualism in a way that you know Hegel's talking about but at other times falls back into it you know it's it's an ongoing struggle within empiricism and there's something dissatisfying or within stoicism and there is something dissatisfying about stoicism um, but um, it is kind of appealing because in stoicism there is this idea of, of mind over matter and that can you know, sometimes when you when you really need to struggle to get through something, sometimes having a belief in mind over matter is is convenient and useful. And so I think that's the attraction of Stoicism because it does attract people when they read it today. It, you know, kind of rings true for people. Uh, but what Hegel, you know, argues is that's really a sorry existence and uh, a sad state, and the real fulfillment is when you sublate into this higher way of thinking so that you think of yourself as both the body and the mind. And, um, and then this really takes on a whole new character. Um, I, I, think, I think Hegel would agree with that, uh, but I think he would think it's a little too simplistic. Okay. Um, he wants to think of of uh, self-contemplation, not necessarily in relation to the body, but even a life and death struggle within the mind itself. Okay, but, but for our purposes, okay, we 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 can <clears throat> we can have a little bit simplified version. Okay, uh, I think I, I think I did a pretty good job of explaining that, and and I. That gets us, you know, close enough to understand how Hegel then becomes influential uh, for Marxism and then for Dussel. Okay, so I'll leave it at that.